All right, good morning. This week is going to be, uh, this sermon's going to be a tad on the long side, but we do have my mother visiting from North Carolina this morning, so we're going to make her travel worthwhile, okay? So last week, of course, the sermon was uh, prior to that. I pointed out that our modern Bibles are translated from the Hebrew Masoretic text. Remember? Right back where we were. Recall that that text is not the original Hebrew. It is instead a copy of the Hebrew that we get from the Leningrad Leningrad Codex of 1st millennium A.D., all right? But the Greek Septuagint was translated more than a thousand years before the Masoretic text, somewhere around 250 B.C. Uh, it's, so it's not translated from the Masoretic, but rather from an older copy of the Hebrew. So the Septuagint is a more original to the source of the Hebrew. And of course, we have the Samaritan Pentateuch, which we've talked about as well. And it also predates the Masoretic text, you'll see, by more than a thousand years. So this is another original source that we talked about last week. I do not have a copy of the Samaritan Pentateuch, a physical copy. I do, however, have the PDF version of that. And there's several translations out there, but I do have at least one. So <clears throat> when I say the Samaritan Pentateuch, I actually have taken the time to check it for myself. Like I said uh, last week, all of these sources... The older copy of Hebrew, of course, the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, Paul himself, and Flavius Josephus all looked to something older than the Masoretic text. Okay, this is where they're getting their information from. So obviously an older copy of the Hebrew than the Masoretic text or the Leningrad Codex, since they all of them predate it. Okay, so we understand that. Now we discussed last week how uh, the Masoretic text is distort distorted a few things, like Goliath's height and the Egyptian captivity. So this morning we're going to look at another instance of this. So in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, we have the genealogies of Adam and Noah. And you can find those if you wish. We're going to start with 11, Genesis 11:12, 11, which says, And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begot Salah. In other translations you'll find Shelah. Salah, Shelah, and the different spellings. So Arphaxad was 35, it says, according to Genesis, when his son was born. This is the King James Masoretic text. If we look at Genesis 11:14, we say, And Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. Okay, so we have Salah is 30 years old when his son is born. And if you look through Genesis 11 on down to 22, you'll see um, Sarug being 30 when he had Nahor, on and on and on. Now, if we take the list of genealogies from the King James from Genesis 11 and we put them here, we'll see this is the age of the men when their sons were born. So we have Arphaxad, 35, Salah, 30, Eber, 34, Peleg, 30, Ru, 32, and Sarug, 30. So according to King James, these are the ages of men when their sons were born. But if we look at the Septuagint's version of Genesis 11, we'll find this. Here's the Septuagint. And Arphaxad lived 135 years and begat Salah. And then look at 11, <coughs> 14. You'll see in the Septuagint, in Genesis 11, between verses uh, 12 and 14, you'll see an extra Canaan in that genealogy, which we'll discuss later. So there is an extra Canaan that doesn't belong. Genesis 11:14, 14, and Salah lived 100 and 30 years, and begot Eber. So you can see on down to verse 22, in the LXX, the Septuagint, you'll find that there's an extra 100 years placed on each one of these men's ages but when their sons were born. So we have an extra 100 years now that pops up in the Greek Septuagint, both copies, that would be Vaticanus and Alexandrinus texts, codexes, and also the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, I have uh, G Josephus' genealogies as well. We'll see what Josephus says about these men's ages. According to Josephus, this would be the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 6. Now, what Josephus does in the genealogies is he doesn't go through this in order. He actually starts at Sarug and works his way backwards. Okay? So, according to 
Josephus, Ragu, Ra, he's got a G, G in there, Rao, had Sarag at 130, that's correct. Phileg had Eber begat Phileg in his 134th year. I'm skipping through. Arvixad was the son of Shem and born 12 years after the deluge. All right, so when you go through Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 6, you'll see that Josephus also agrees with the Septuagint and Samaritan Pentateuch genealogies of having that extra 100 on each age that the King James Masoretic text leaves out. So here we have the genealogies all at once, you see, and here's the differences. So in the Hebrew Masoretic text, we can see that these 100s that are attested to by these other sources are actually missing. They've been dropped. And the implications of this are very serious. Very serious. But here I have, how many witnesses do we need according to the Bible? Two or three. Well, here I've got three that say, yes, this 100 belongs. Our fourth witness, which we don't need, but we can pull if we'd like, are the Dead Sea Scrolls of Qumran recovered in 1947. We'll get to those later. So here is a very quick chart. And this is very f similar, if you remember last week, to the phrase, and Canaan. Remember how that was dropped in the Masoretic versus these other sources, which helped straighten out our 400-year timeline. So this is what the chart looks like. If we take the Masoretic text's ages and we plot them onto a chart, this, of course, is Kent Hovind's chart. And this is what the, using the Masoretic text genealogies, this is what they look like. It's very important here, you can see that Shem lived long enough to see his great, 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 I'm sorry, great, to six generations down, grandson, Abraham. And of course, Shem lived long enough, according to this chart, to interact with Abraham, right? So that's the Masoretic text. So Shem outlived all of his sons and grandsons down to the eighth generation just because he survived the flood, I guess, that made him Superman or something. But when you take the extra hundred years that we get from the other sources and we plot those on a chart, right? we take these extra hundred, we plot those on a chart, all of a sudden everything seems to make sense. You see now Shem dies before his son, and Arphaxad dies before his son, and so on and so forth, just as genealogies are supposed to do. Everybody knows that the generation prior dies off before the next generation. This is what it looks like when plotted out with that extra 100 years. So it's quite obvious that Shem did not interact with Abraham. He'd been dead almost 500 years, you see? So Shem died before his, and so on and so on. So that's each generation dying in succession, just as we know happens. That's reality. So these extra 100 years are missing from the Masoretic, so we know Shem did not interact with Abraham, according to this. Now, Answers in Genesis actually has a little book. Okay, Answers in Genesis. I actually have the book here. So Answers in Genesis, and in this book they have a little chart, and even on the chart, they're showing Shem dying after Abraham's birth. So answers in Genesis is, of course, using the Masoretic text timeline to verify that Shem, yes, indeed, lived long enough to interact with his great-great-great-great-grandson. So, so what does all this mean? Well, with the ages of the patriarchs straightened out, when this is straightened out, that means that we have an at least an extra 600 years of history now to work with in Genesis. But we do have a problem with Nahor. And according to the King James of 11, Genesis 11:24, and Nahor lived nine and 20 years and begot Terah. Right? Well, according to the Septuagint, and Nahor lived 179 years and begot Terah. Right? And I told you these names will change in the Greek. So that's all right. That's the same verse. So Nahor is 179 years old, as opposed to what? 29. So that gives us an extra 150 years. Tack that on to the 
600 we gained from the other genealogies. Now we can play around with 750 years extra in the Old Testament histories. Now creation scientists say that Noah's, the flood in Noah's day occurred around 2350 B.C. And they're using Mesoretic timelines to do so. We add our 750 years onto that, and we get somewhere close to the neighborhood of 3100 B.C. Because of the genealogies, you see. So just a little bit of math, and we're able to push that off. But what does this do? What does this do for us? Well, atheists will argue with us that the flood is impossible that it ever happened. If it was indeed a worldwide flood, if the worldwide flood happened in Noah's day, then there should be water damage on those pyramids over there in Egypt. So everybody knows the Egyptian pyramids predate Noah's flood, right? So we should have water damage on the pyramids. That's the argument atheists use to disprove the Bible. And it usually traps a lot of Christians because then they're like, well, then the Bible's not true. We have to question the Bible. But this date comes primarily from the calculations. This date the creation scientists use come primarily from the calculations of a one James Usher, Archbishop of Ireland, right? Now, I happen to have Usher's Annals of the World, a complete compendium here in my library. I have it here, the entire book. It's very nice. It comes in its own book box. So I know, and I open it here, and I have an Usher's book. I'm not going to read them all, but here is the genealogies. You do the math. He has the dates all lined up, and yes, he talks about the 10th day of the second month, and in the 600th year of the life of Moa, on the 17th day of the second month, Sunday, December 7th, he, together with his children and living creatures of all kinds, had entered into the ark. God sent rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. And then he puts all the dates together. And if you do all the math, just like the creation scientists do, using Usher's book, you will come out to the date of 2350. So that's where the date comes from that creation scientists claim. Now I also have the CD-ROM. This book came with a CD-ROM. Okay, compact disc, read-only memory. Right? I put this in my computer, and I took screenshots of everything Usher was saying. So all of what I just showed you in the book all ends up being mapped out, just like we saw earlier. And I did investigate all of these little hot links here. You've got answers in early China, Abraham from Egypt. You go back here. You click on any one of these words and they'll bring up little sermons and little snippets of information. If you scroll down to all of the information found on this CD-ROM, it's all AnswersInGenesis.com. It's all Answers in Genesis approved, which we already said had the timeline messed up. Right? So these, all of this, this entire CD-ROM, which is the screenshots from this, from my computer, all of these, and if you see here, if you go through his, he's got Shem all the way down with Abraham too. So that agrees with answers in Genesis. Now it's generally accepted that Usher's dates are true. However, based on his calculations in the Masoretic text, along with some others who agree and uphold this, the creation scientists and everybody knows the date of the flood is because we've gone off of James Usher's calculations. Okay, Answers in Genesis uses it too, obviously. They're in cahoots with the guy. And while I'm the subject, I am aware that the book of Jubilees does some explaining about Bible chronologies and genealogies. I am very aware that you could use the book of Jubilees if you wish. However, I do not consider this canon whatsoever. At best... At best, this is a Hebrew midrash or pseudepigrapha. At best, it is nowhere near Bible canon. And, um, and I'll use this. So if you have the book of Jubilees, this is what the book of Jubilees, now I've read it, I've got several copies and translations. The book of Jubilees purports to come from a new divinely authorized speaker called the Angel of Presence, according to Jubilees, 
chapter 2, verse 1. And the angel, of course, that speaks to Moses uh, claims to be God-ordained authority. Okay, so you've got this angel handing all these words down to Moses. Uh, the book also reveals a new agenda that is an adherence to a 364-day solar calendar, Jubilee 632. And of course, the, the absolute most blasphemous thing that came out of this book to me is the fact that it serves as a newly revealed revelation occurring ages before Moses and the heavenly tablets are said to predate the Torah. So this book comes from heavenly tablets that predate Moses' books. And the Jubilees possesses a superseding authority over the law of Moses for that reason. Now, if that's not enough to throw this book out, I don't know what is. And of course, the, uh, it provides a chronological arrangement of sacred history governed by the Jubilee cycles. That's the whole thing about this book. For anyone accepted who accepts this as authoritative, however, careful. Jubilees provides a theological rationale for altering chronological data in biblical texts, especially in the Second Temple era. So if you ever hear people moving around dates in the Bible using the Jubilees, it came from this book, which of course now we know that uh, the unknown author is someone who deceptively posed as Moses, and pin this book uh, anywhere from 160 to 150 B.C. So this is not Bible canon. It's not even close to Bible canon. If you're familiar enough with it, and then you hear some sacred uh, calendar guys that stick to the solar and lunar calendars, read this, and, you fear, and you, as soon as you find out their argument comes from the book of Jubilees, toss it out. It's at best Hebrew Midrash. Um, the rabbis like to use it too. They don't consider it canon, but they will use it. So stay away from it as Bible truth. Um, and also, of course, if you read enough of it, the book of Jubilees also claims that um, Noah was the first physician and apothecary who received the knowledge of natural medicine from the angels of God so that his offspring could be saved from the ailments inflicted upon them by evil spirits and demons. That's what the book of Jubilees purports. So you can read it at your own peril, but I would not suggest using it as Bible canon or Bible fact at all. It's almost the furthest thing from that. It's, I wouldn't put Jubilees anywhere near biblical truths. But I am aware that some people will use the chronological timetables of Jubilees to move dates around in the Bible. I would not suggest doing that. So anyway... Uh, where we? Oh yes, the flood of Noah. Now it's occurring 700 years earlier than previously thought. So what about the pyramids? Well, according to Egyptian history and Egyptologists, the Great Pyramids of Giza were built around 2550 BC. Okay, now that's archaeological evidence, which puts them about 200 years earlier than the flood data the creation scientists put forth. Right, So that's where they're getting this. If the pyramids were built here, and if the flood occurred here, why are there not watermarks upon, with significant water damage on the pyramids of Giza? If it's worldwide. If it's worldwide. I, we're not going to argue that this morning. It's, we're not going to go down that wa rabbit hole. But that's their argument. If the Bible's true then where's the water damage? And of course, most modern Christians are stupefied, right? So, that means that the pyramids were built before the flood and before the Tower of Babel event, which everyone forgets to put on the timeline, right? So, Tower of Babel's off down over here, right? United, then divided. Okay, so, and even the ancient name Mizraim is what? The name of Egypt, right? Remember this? And the sons of Ham, who? Cush, Mizraim, Foot, and Canaan. And remember, we went through the whole map that one time earlier last summer, where I was like, oh yeah, the Cushites, we know those guys, they went south. Mizraim, an ancient name for the land of Goshen and Egypt. Foot, remember the Footites? And Canaanites. We know these guys. We know all these families. We know where they went. Okay, so how are we? How do we have 
Hamites in Egypt before they jumped off the ark. Or Ham went south, built these, came back up, had the flood, then went back down. So it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Now, the pyramids of Giza, of course, uh, their um, construction's a bit contested, okay? So they're not the oldest pyramids either. The pyramids of Giza are not the oldest Egyptian pyramids. I have several, several books on pyramids. You'll be in uh, Dewey Decimal 932 if you're wanting to look up these. I just have a few. According to John Weeks and the pyramids, his little chart here, he tells us that the 2686 BC was the building of the Step Pyramid. Now, the Step Pyramid of Saqqara is indeed the oldest Egyptian pyramid. It's not the kind of pyramid you think of when you think pyramids of Giza. It's actually more like a ziggurat. Okay? Um, if you want to, yeah, the ziggurat pyramids. Okay? According to uh, Wake, the origin and significance of the Great Pyramid, just getting some dates. He's showing that the Great Pyramid is built around the year 2170. And he's using points plotted by the stars, just like we're watching the star in Bethlehem. So we know that there were uh, astronomers. They had a little stick that was shaped like this, kind of like a surveyor. And they oriented the points of the pyramid to the northern star. And he says the points of the northern s the pyramid and the point of the northern star align during several years, one of which is 2170 B.C. So there's another one, the Great Pyramids. When they were built, according to Basil Stewart, if you know this name, you should. The Great Pyramid, he, uh, Basil Stewart's Kingdom Identity Writings. He wrote, What Then Shall We Eat? I just sent this pamphlet out to a believer earlier this week. And now I'm using his book. And he says that the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, built around the reign of Zoser, around 2707, 2707 to 2688 B.C. So if you take the so Great Pyramid of Saqqara, the Step Pyramid, which was built about 100 years before the Great Pyramids of Giza, that still gives us about 2586 B.C. So you see we're still right there that the pyramids are indeed, it doesn't matter which one you go with, they're still before the flood. I can move them all around here, and they're still going to be before this date. Okay, unless you go by the North Star one. But he had several listed. The earliest is 21. The earliest. He might be closer than he thought on the North Star aligning with the pyramid's points, and that's how they surveyed them. All right. So, now I'm using Bible history. We're going to use Bible history and archaeological evidence this morning. Okay? On this. Now, I am aware that there are uh, other accounts that would seem to be able to tie in these dates. And like I said, you have to investigate those accounts, one of which is the Ju Book of Jubilees. Remember, I said, I understand and I am aware that that does move the timelines around. But we're using archaeological evidence and the Bible, nothing else. The Bible's text, Mesrek. Now, I do have a book here called Genesis Revisited. Is modern science catching up with ancient knowledge? Okay, now this guy is going on about the fact that on Mars there was a plate, a photo found of a face, and he links that face to the uh, Sphinx. Okay, and he says, uh, Was the purpose, as the Egyptian text suggests, to send the message from heaven to the Sphinx on Earth, a command according to the, which the gods acted, sent from one face to another, fair of face? So, if such was the purpose, ample, ample evidence has been presented in the volumes of the Earth Chronicle series and indicates that the Giza pyramids were not the handiwork of pharaohs, but were constructed by the Anunnaki. Before the deluge, their spaceport was in Mesopotamia. And after the deluge, the spaceport was located in the Sinai Peninsula and two great pyramids of Giza, two artificial mountains that served as beacons for the landing corridor, whose apex was anchored on Mount Ararat, the Near East's most visible natural feature. So yes, I am aware that the Pyramid of Giza could be a spaceport, so you don't have to remind me. And before we laugh, there's a whole chapter on how this knowledge came to us. But to this day, what we call a civilized society still owes its foundations to the time when kingship was lowered from heaven 
Like kingship, wisdom was lowered to heaven from hev- lowered to earth from heaven, granted to mankind by the Anunnaki gods. It was their sole decision that scientific knowledge was passed on to mankind, usually through the medium of selected individuals. As a rule, however, the chosen person belonged to a priesthood, another first, that stayed with mankind for millennia through the Middle Ages when priests and monks were also the scientists. And the Genesis story of the antediluvian patriarch called Enoch is summed up in the statement that he did not die but was taken up to the Lord when he was 365 years old, a number, a, a number that corresponds to the number of days in a year. But considerably more information about Enoch is provided in the book of Enoch, which was not made part of the Bible. In it, the knowledge, in the knowledge imparted by angels to Enoch, it is described in much detail, including knowledge of mining and metallurgy, and the secrets of the lower world, geography, the way the earth is watered, astronomy, and the laws governing celestial motions, how to calculate the calendar, knowledge of the plants and flowers and foods and so on, all shown to Enoch in special books and heavenly tablets. Okay, we already threw the book of Jubilees out for having this pseudepigraphal works. So I am aware that the book of Enoch and other sources purports that the pyramids of Giza are spaceports and that the Anunnaki were on earth long before God and long before Adam digging for gold. I've often wondered if there's such an advanced space civilization, why are they just gold diggers? Right? Anyway. Now, that's interesting that we read all about that, right? So yes, I'm aware of the book of Jubilees. I'm aware of several pi- pseudepigraphal works and other books purporting to be biblical canon that are not. Even down to the Anunnaki and the sons of Anu, children of the earth, right? I've read all about the great Mesopotamian mythologies. However, there is something in our Bible that seems to back something up, I believe. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, Besides me, there is no God. That would be Anunnaki gods too, right? What's John say? And all things were made through him. Who? Anu? God. And without him was not anything made that was made. Enoch. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who formed the earth and made it, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now that's what I believe. Not Jubilees. Not Anunnaki. But what's really interesting is, and of course that has no place in our Bible, notice the majority of these verses come from the prophet Isaiah. Do you notice that? So here's a uh, brief overview of Isaiah very quickly. I just grabbed one handbook. I have about 50 handbooks of the Bible. I grabbed this one because it seemed to be the most, um, the one that sums it up the quickest. The book of Isaiah is the best known prophetic book of the Old Testament, probably because of his emphasis on the theme of salvation and his prophecies about the coming Messiah. Because of its anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ and his message of redemption, Isaiah is sometimes called the fifth gospel. Now one interesting thing about Isaiah, of all the prophets mentioned and quoted in the New Testament, Isaiah takes the cake. Of all the books listed and mentioned in the New Testament alone, Deuteronomy is the most quoted by Christ. But the most quoted book of the law is Deuteronomy. Most quoted prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah was called to the prophetic ministry in the year the king Uzziah died, about 740 B.C. In dramatic vision, he showed the temple, to, and, I'm sorry, he preached God's message of judgment and hope to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah for the next 40 years. In the early part of Isaiah's ministry, Judah's sister nation, the northern kingdom of Israel, fell to the Assyrians because of their sin and rebellion. We all know this. Isaiah declared to Judah that the same thing would happen to them unless they quit worshiping false gods and worship the one true God. You see his message? 
But the prophet's message of God's coming judgment was intermingled with prophecies of hope for the future. Their positive prophecies are for which Isaiah is best known. Okay, so that's a little background on what Isaiah was doing. And why is he stressing this to the Judeans? Why? Well, Isaiah's statements here because are made because the false religion and the religious movements at the present time of Jerusalem during Isaiah's day were the philosophies of Persian dualism. Persian dualism. That's what is gaining ground in Jerusalem at the time. This is why Isaiah is saying these things over and over and over again. Now this Persian dualism is a religion in which there's a concept of there being one God who is responsible for all the good in the world, and another God who is responsible for all the world's evils. That's the dualism. All right, Isaiah's statements declare that God is not just one half of reality. You see, that's the thing. And this statement, of course, is a direct contradiction of the growing popularity of Persian, Persian dualism, which also goes by another name, Zoroastrianism, of Isaiah's day. And you see in declaring this message, Isaiah, his intent was that no one should claim anything, whether good or bad, is the product of anything but the one true God of Israel. That was his message, and of course it was a direct affront to the Persian dualism of the time. And anyway, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I am fully aware of other mythologies claiming creation stories, flood stories, and remarking on the various uh, pyramids found on earth. I'm, I'm fully aware of those things. Uh, but since they are indeed mythologies, we'll just leave them as fantasy literature and not use them for cold, hard facts, okay? So I'm aware of those things. Nothing wrong with fantasy fiction, as long as it stays fiction, okay? So, shockingly, this book, um, The Genesis Revisited, it's got a Dewey Decimal Classification of 930, 9.30. I just happen to have the textbook for Dewey Decimal Classifications here. I bought all of them. 9.30, of course, is archaeology, study of past civilizations through discovery, collection, and interpretation of material remains. If you go to 9.32, you'll be in pyramidology. Okay? So this book is actually listed as factual archaeology, believe it or not. Uh, at very best, it should be 398.2, which is fairy tales and folklore, or... 299, which would be comparative mythologies, comparative religions. But anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah, Noah's flood. Okay, so there's other sources that purport different things. We're going with the Bible, and we're going with archaeological evidence, okay? Now, remember this guy? Remember this documentary? Okay, if you haven't watched it yet, catch up. Well, anyway, he says in uh, this video that Egyptian history needs to move forward 200 years. Do you remember that? And once he moved... Egyptian history forward 200 years, the events of the Bible and the events of, are, of found in archaeological evidence all lined up. Remember that? And it fixes the whole thing. So this makes the pyramids construction then 200 years later, right? If you use his timeline, which fixes it, right? which fixes it, because once you use his documentary and say 200 years forward, move those pyramids 200 years into the future, now you've got the pyramids contemporary with the flood in Moses' day. So that fixes our problem. Now there's legitimate reasons to be looking for flood waters, provided as a floral black flood, on the pyramids. That fixes it, right? Well, no, because we haven't had time yet for the Tower of Babel to occur. You see? Now we're out of time. We've got to have the flood happen, the Tower of Babel, the divisions of the nations, and then the pyramids. You see, we're out of time still. So even with the moving of the pyramids age around, we still don't have for the tidal Tower of Babel's occurrence. And if a worldwide flood did occur, we still don't have water damage on these period, pyramids. Significant water damage. Significant water damage. So what do we do? Well, our only option now is to question the biblical timeline. We have to question the biblical timeline. All right? So, 
Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not questioning biblical authority. I'm questioning whether or not the timetable adhered to by James Usher, creation scientists, and what's displayed to us in the Masoretic text is accurate or biblical at all. That's what I'm asking, because something's wrong. And of course, like I said, most of the time, atheists have us right where they need us. But if we go back to what we found out earlier with our Septuagint genealogies, uh, we have an extra 750 years, recall, which places the flood event back to 3100 B.C. or so. So that's a uh, good 550 years before the pyramids. Now those extra hundreds of years also allows Noah's sons to move down and populate Egypt after the Tower of Babel. You see, now we've got plenty of time. We have 500 years to play around with. Using the Masoretic timeline, though, atheists say that there wasn't enough time for the Tower of Babel event to, be, to have taken place. And they've got us there, too. Because if we use our timelines from the Masoretic text, they're right. There is not enough time for this tower to be built and then the nations to spread and then Egypt. There's just not enough time. There's only 100 years or so. And the reason they say this is because the Tower of Babel happened right here. Okay, and we're going to get to this right here. The name plague means what? Divided, right? Of course, you check Genesis 10.25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day was the earth divided. What's that mean? Before the Tower of Babel, they were united, right? Or not divided. After the Tower of Babel, they were divided. Peleg means divided. So Peleg's father, Eber named his son after the events of Babel in the dispersion, okay? And of course, we know who Eber is. Eber, the father of the Hebrew peoples, the Hebrew language. Of course, his language moved all around after the Tower of Babel, did it not, right? So the Tower of Babel had to have occurred sometime in Eber's life before the birth of Peleg, since he was named after the events, right? Now we'll check, uh, Josephus says something about that too. I'll read him again. Salah, the son of Arphaxad, was the son of Heber, for whom they or originally called the Jews Hebrews. Heber begat Joktan and Peleg. He was called Peleg because he was born at the dispersion of the nations to their several countries, for Peleg among the Hebrews signifies division. So Josephus understood these things too. So, if we use the Masoretic timetable though, not the Septuagint, if we go to the Masoretic timetable, and there's what I just read out of Flavius Josephus. Peleg signifies division. Now, if we use the Masoretic timetable that we have from our King James, we only have a hundred years between the flood of Noah and the birth of Peleg. That's it. Right? But this is not enough time to build the Tower of Babel if indeed it was worldwide. Right? If it was worldwide. That's not enough. We don't have enough workers by then. Not to mention we're out of time now for Egypt and Mizraim and Ham to travel and all that. We're out of time. But once you plot the years according to what we did earlier, once you plot the years according to this chart, we have 750 years or so, and that 500 years... Now, we have plenty of time for Mizraim to go south to Egypt, right? And there's our first step pyramid of Saqqara, so it's being built now. We have plenty of time for this. Why? Because on our time period, we have 500 years between the Tower of Babel instead of 100, and we have 250 years for the dispersion to go and build the pyramids. Plenty of time. You push Noah's all the way back here, which this does when you add those 100 years. It can be 3,000, it can be 3,100, it doesn't matter. We have plenty of time. Not the 100 they're giving us in the Masoretic text. And like I said, that's plenty of time for Mizraim to go all the way south. But this only works if you follow the original Hebrew texts, not the corrupted Masoretic now, creation scientists say that the earth is 6,000 years old, okay? And those are 
based on James Usher's calculations. This is actually a picture from Answers in Genesis website. Okay, 6,000 years old. But if we go with our extra 750, it actually pushes the earth closer to 7,000 years old. Okay, so we get an extra millennium. That's what those hundreds do for us. They turn it around and they make it actually make sense. Now, the Septuagint is not a perfect translation, like I said. If you look in Genesis 11, like I told you earlier, you'll see that between Arphaxad and Salah, there is an extra Canaan here. There's an extra Canaan in this genealogy. It doesn't matter if you're using the Vaticanus or Alexandrius codexes. That extra Canaan is there. But it does not belong. The oldest known copies of the Septuagint do not include this extra Canaan. Only newer copies do. You'll see this Canaan if you go to the genealogies in Luke as well. But the oldest copies of the Greek New Testament do not include this Canaan in the genealogies of Luke. The extra Canaan is also missing from the Septuagint. I'm, I'm sorry, the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's missing. And the works of Josephus. It's missing. When I read through Josephus' genealogies, this extra Canaan is not there. The extra Canaan is also missing, if you want to check. He's also missing from 1 Chronicles 118. He's not in that genealogy either, in either, the New, in either the Greek or Hebrew. So I think it's safe to say with enough witnesses showing it's missing, it does not belong in the text. It was added for whatever reason, but it does not belong there. So just ignore it. Okay? Ignore that one in the Septuagint. And it is not, this Canaan is not on the chart I showed you earlier. He's not there, you see. I left him out. So that extra Canaan is indeed just an extra Canaan. And now you know why he was not in there. But now all this is done. Now that we've looked at all this, our question now, so the extra hundred moving Noah's Ark around, why then did the Masoretes, the Jewish scribes who were responsible for the text, why did they drop those extra 100 years? Why were these dropped out? Was it on purpose? And if it was on purpose, why? Well, I'll tell you why. I think it was on purpose. I think the Bible's been tampered with by the Jewish scribes and Pharisees. Let's go to Hebrews 4.14. You'll see, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Hebrews 5.5. 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right? We know these verses. All right, so Jesus is the high priest then, the high priest. But every Jewish person knows that in order to be a high priest, you have to have it come from the tribe of Levi. And of course, Jesus didn't come from Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. So according to the rabbis, Jesus' own lineage disqualifies him from ever being a high priest. The rabbis say, Jesus is not a high priest. Jesus is not from Levi. And that's why they can kill him. That's why they can deny his being the Messiah. Right? Okay. But the New Testament attests to us that Christ is indeed the high priest. But if he's not from Levi, how? Well, because he's not a high priest according to Levitical priesthood. He's a high priest according to a higher priesthood. The order of Melchizedek. Right? Now we've got, well that fixes it, Pastor Reed. Right? For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who made Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Remember that in Genesis? Son of Gomorrah? Lot got kidnapped. And blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of part of all, the first instance of tithing in the Bible, by the way. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, 
having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. There's the accolades of Jesus Christ, the high priest, right? So, what do we do with all this, Reed? What does this have to do with 100 years on the old Arphex ad and Noah and all that? So according to this, Melchizedek is who? Well, he has no father. He has no mother. He's without descent, or in, otherwise, in other words, he has no genealogy. Neither beginning of days nor end of life. Right? But Hebrews says, Jesus is the new high priest, not according to the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life, right? We read that in the Bible. Now, in order to disprove Jesus' priesthood, the Jews and several others, this is not exclusive to the kingdom ministry or, or Judaism, I'm sorry, Judaism or Christianity, they say Melchizedek is Shem. The guy in the, that makes an appearance in Genesis that Melchizedek is Shem himself. That's what the rabbis say. The problem with Shem, though, what's the problem with Shem, son of Noah? The problem with Shem is we know his father. We know who his mother is. We know his genealogy. It's listed in Genesis. We know he was birthed, and we know when he died. All is a matter of Bible records. So how are the rabbis saying Melchizedek is Shem? Because we know these things about Shem, right? And also we know that uh, he cannot be Melchizedek based on what Hebrew says about Mil Melchizedek, right? And we also know that Shem is the ancestor all the way down here to who? Levi. And you say, okay, so what the rabbis like to tell us is Shem inherited the priesthood from, Mel or Shem is Melchizedek, the high priest, and then Shem gave that priesthood to Abraham, who then gave that priesthood to Levi. Right? It's an inherited priesthood. That's what the Jewish rabbis say. Okay. And if that's true, if this is true, then that makes all the statements we read about it in Hebrews false. Right? So, if Shem is indeed Melchizedek, then that, that makes the rabbis claim that Jesus Christ cannot be a high priest true. You see what they've done. They've taken away Jesus' high priesthood, and since Jesus isn't of the tribe of Levi, well, he can't be a high priest or the high priest. That's the rationale. And the rabbis to this day teach this. To this day. I have the Babylonian Talmud here with me. I'll read you from Tractate Nadarum 32b. Just so you know, that's where we're at. And here's what the Babylonian Talmud says. The Holy One, blessed be he, intended to bring forth the priesthood from Shem, as it is written, he, Melchizedek, was the priest of the Most High God, but because he gave precedence in his blessing to Abraham over God, he brought it forth from Abraham, as it is written, and blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, said Abraham to him, is the blessing of a servant to be given precedence over that of his master. This midrash identifies Melchizedek with Shem, the son of Noah, Abraham's eighth ancestor. The Babylonian Talmud tells us that Melchizedek is Shem. I just read it out of Nadarim 32b. And the rabbis teach this. Okay? So the rabbis teach that. The problem with Shem actually being Melchizedek is this. Remember how we had on the other biblical timelines that Shem had lived long enough to interact with Abraham? Remember that? Well, according to the other Bible timelines, Shem lived long enough to interact with Abraham, get the tithe, get the bread and wine, right? But according to this, how did Shem interact with Abraham if he's been dead for 500 years? How was Melchizedek Shem if Shem's dead? And who did Abram meet then? We know who Abram met. The one true God, right? Not Shem. But obviously then, Shem is not Melchizedek. Obviously not. He can't be. No end of days and all that. But you already knew that because I got that from the Talmud. 
right? You, you already knew that. But Jewish scribes dropped the 100 years in the Masoretic text to make Shem live long enough to interact with Abraham and then take Shem, make him Melchizedek. Shem's the ancestor of Levi. Jesus is disqualified. I believe the Jewish scribes of the Masoretic text purposely dropped that 100 to undermine Jesus' high priesthood. Then they could kill him. Right? That's what I believe. I believe the Masoretic text has been tampered with in, that, in this case. And there are several other reasons, other ways, which we'll get to later, about the Masoretic text being messed around with that ends up being nothing more than Jewish fables and traditions of men. And there's a, some of them are going to shock you. And yet, when people say Melchizedek is Shem, right? When people say Melchizedek is Shem, the only witness they ever call, the only one is, well, look at the genealogies. That's the only one they ever use. And it's, of course, it's the, it's the MT, Masoretic text. Um, they don't have any other witnesses. That's it. I'm like, well, what, what proves to me that Shem is Melchizedek? They'll say, well, look at the genealogies. Genesis 11. Sometimes they'll pull the book of Jasher, which is a midrash. Sometimes they'll pull the Talmud or Targum or a rabbi's commentary. But I'm asking for biblical proof, scriptural evidence that says Shem is Melchizedek. And there is not any proof of that. The only claims is that the Masoretic text seems to have enough time for Shem living to interact with Abraham, thus making him Shem Melchizedek. And that's just not scriptural. It's not a proof. That's the only thing. And of course, if the 100 years that we're talking about, if they were dropped prior to the Masoretic text, let's just say they were dropped before the Masoretic text, the Leningrad Codex, 1000 AD. If they were dropped any time before that, what Paul all of a sudden says to Timothy and Titus starts to make sense. Neither giving heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. This is a warning to Timothy. Titus, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and vain. Then he turns around and says, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn us from the truth. So don't give heed to Jewish fables and disputes about genealogies. Why would Paul be concerned about that? Why would the Jews have anything to say about Jesus' genealogy? Why would they want to contend those things to the Christians in Paul's day? Right? Maybe the Jewish distortions of Scriptures were done on purpose to disprove Christ as the Messiah. They've been doing this since day one. Paul was no stranger to this, obviously. That's been their M.O. for ages. And interestingly, rabbis flat out refuse to use the Septuagint. They will not use it. As a matter of fact, the Septuagint has a... Um, it was purported that the Christians in Paul's day, the early Christian church, they had the Septuagint versions of the Old and, of course, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. But the Greek Septuagint was apparently what they had in their hands when they argued with the rabbis. So the rabbis flat refused this copy. And you can see why. Right? Now there's some people that hold on to King James only for whatever reason. Maybe it supports one of their pet doctrines. Who knows? As I go along, you'll see, I think you're right, Reed. I might be on to something. The rabbis say, don't use this. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Use our rabbi-approved Masoretic text so we can keep telling Christians we're the chosen people. Right? Then I have other pastors in the nation saying, I have this doctrine don't read any other Bible versions. It might disprove it. If you do use another Bible in this church, you're out. You see? All right. Now, 
We know the 100 years were removed, and I think we know why now, right? In the Masoretic text. They were dropped out on purpose with the intent to deceive. That's what I say. Okay, so the Dead Sea Scrolls found in uh, several, several caves in Qumran and covered in 1947. They've pieced them together. This is all still going on, right? So you'll say, well, why, doesn't this, why haven't I heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Back in uh, Pastor Emery's time, these have still yet to be cracked. They're still piecing them together. They're still finding them. Back even in Dave Barley's ministry, Pastor Barley, they were still getting these. They're still finding these things. They're still piecing them together. They're still translating them. So this is a work in progress. And as more and more and more come to light, it seems that the Dead Sea Scrolls were written between 300 and 200 B.C., which predates the Masoretic Text by a long shot. And every time you use the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'd say 98% of the time, the Dead Sea Scrolls side with the Septuagint's texts. The Dead Sea Scrolls side with the Septuagint's texts, proving to me that the Septuagint draws on a much older version of the Hebrew than the Masoretic. Than the Masoretic. So that's another witness we have, right? We'll get more to that, to these guys next time, because I'll show you how to use the Dead Sea Scrolls and where they come in as witnesses for us, okay? And in closing, I'm going to leave you with some homework. So uh, some of you have asked which copy of the Septuagint I use. Okay, here I have the Brenton's translation, which you guys are familiar with. The Brenton's translation is the Alexandrian Codex. Okay, and then I also have the Orthodox version of the Septuagint. This one uses the Codex Vaticanus. Okay, I use both. Because as you'll see next week, we're going to have some problems with some of the anti- and post-Diluvian patriarchs' ages. Once again, Methuselah, his age is different in one over the other. We have to get to the bottom of that. We'll get to why pastors in this age badmouth the LXX. Right? We kind of know why now. Don't give me a... Don't misunderstand me. The King James is what I read. The King James is what I teach from. It's the only one linked to a concordance. But I advise other copies of the Bible, other copies of the text, do your own research. The Bible calls it being as a Berean. Okay, nothing wrong with research. Best read always, always advocates research on your own because I know you guys are the most intelligent believers out there. All of you. And you're bright. So for further reading, I would suggest... Pyramidology by Adam Rutherford, Anglo-Israel believer. Pyramidology, he did three volumes. It's dry reading. Uh, but they are excellent, excellent books. On Now, I, I haven't even read the whole thing. But Adam Rutherford, an excellent resource. He also wrote this, Anglo-Saxon Israel. He's one of us. Okay, now this book has been revised several times. Okay, as a matter of fact, I think I've got one. Yes, the new one is the abridged version of the same book. Okay, so let me explain this. This can be, this is not in our bookstore at America's Promise. This can be found at Artisan Publishers, and I'm sure all of you out there are familiar with them. So it is a, this big one, this is the abridged version, Okay. And this has been, this was revised several times. And you'll see here it says Israel, Britain, or Anglo-Saxon Israel. Because for some reason he revised it, and when he revised it, he switched the titles. And this one here is Anglo-Saxon Israel, or Britain, Israel, Britain, an explanation of the origin, function, and destiny of the Norse, Anglo, Celto, Saxon race in the British Empire, USA, Holland, Scandinavia, and Iceland. An excellent compendium of our people's histories and how it relates to Bible history, okay? And this is not a bookstore book. Grab it from Artisan. Another copy, another book I would highly suggest, E. Raymond Capt, Study in Pyramidology. We do offer this in our bookstore. I have this assigned copy here. This is an excellent resource for continuing on in the studies if you'd like. Another one is, the reason I... Mention Rutherford. 
is because he has this book here, Bible Chronology, okay? And I've actually got the hardback Bible Chronology, okay? Bible Chronology comes with its own separate appendix, okay, of charts and tables and things, all right? This is Adam Rutherford. If you're actually, if you're familiar, if anybody is familiar with this uh, booklet here, okay? Israel, Kingdom Scriptures with Bible Chronology, if you go to the back, the tables in the back are actually Adam Rutherford's from the Bible chronologies, okay? So that's, it's actually from this book, an excellent resource, all right? And one interesting thing is I have a scan of um, one of his charts here, and I scanned it because I couldn't find a PDF, but I actually printed it off too. So I'm going to read you this little note here and this little note here, okay? A careful, and says, note on the patriarch, patriarchal periods. A careful expl examination of most ancient MSS, Masoretic, and versions of Genesis reveals the, unreliabili the unreliability of the Masoretic system of chronology <coughs> in regard to the earliest times. Archaeological research has also proved that the Masoretic figures, as appearing in the AV, authorized version, are completely untenable prior to the time of Abraham in this table. The chronology of the period from Adam to Abraham is based on the Septuagint system, which for the epoch subsequent to the flood is confirmed by the Samaritan Hebrew text, Samaritan Pentateuch, and in agreement with archaeology. Okay, so you know what he just said. This table that he has is not using the MSS, it's using the LXX Septuagint, and that agrees with archaeology. So Pastor Reed is not a pioneer in this field. This is a long time. And 1956, okay, Dead Sea Scrolls are only nine years old at this time. So this guy's got it figured out before I ever came along. And this is Anglo-Israel Anglo teachings, okay, so... This is not, this is us. And then this note here, notes on the genealogies. For example, between Arphaxad and his descent Selah, there is an intermediary descendant or son named Canaan, as proved by Luke 3 and the Septuagint text of Genesis 10 and also the Hebrew book of Jubilees. Right? But the Samaritan text and the Masoretic text and Josephus are all in agreement that the 135 years mentioned in 11, Genesis 11 the Masoretic shortened to 35, he says. And the interval from the birth of Arvixad to the birth of Salah was not, not to the birth of the intermediary descendant Canaan. He even has the same note that I explained earlier, that extra Canaan does not belong. Rutherford had this figured out in 1956, flipped through his books now, and he's not so far out there. You go through these B.C. dates he's got lined up here, and you start doing the calculations. You've got Methuselah, you've got Noah, you've got the flood beginning, the flood ending, the house of Arphaxad. You go and you start adding these together and subtracting them, as I did, and you will come up with anywhere between 605 and 405 years to play around with to move that ark back, to move that ark back. So this is not Pastor Reed being crazy. This is true. I don't care what answers in Genesis says. This is right. But because he's not afraid to check the other works, the other texts. Okay? So, my research is nothing new. Add this, add this to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And very strange things start to happen to the Scriptures. Very strange things. Uh, which we've seen. And we'll see you next week. That's all we have for today.